Okay, and here's my favorite example, non-cryptographic hash. Uh, CRC, cyclic redundancy check. Uh, what is a CRC? What's it used for? Error, Error detection. Where do you see these things used a lot? Networking. That's right. Networking protocols use these things, okay, to detect errors that occur. So again, and it's basically uh, computed as a, a kind of a long division, okay, sort of a long division, the remainder in some long division calculation. Okay, now um, it's very good at detecting so-called burst errors, and so it's uh, very popular in network protocols and all that, and does a good job. Uh, nothing wrong with using it for an error detection scheme. But why, again, is it not is it not a good idea to use this for a cryptographic hash function? Same reason as before. I mean, CRC is protecting against random errors. That's that right. On the network. So if Trudy is intelligent, she can actually make changes to the data that the CRC will not detect. Okay. In fact, there's tools out there to help you do this. You can go out and you can use. You, know, you can find tools online that will allow you to make changes to the data, and but the CRC stays the same. So it's actually very easy to do. Um, nevertheless, uh, this uh, CRC has been used in places where a cryptographic hash function is called for, in particular in the WEP protocol, which um, we may cover when we get to chapter 10. And it has really serious implications, right? It means you essentially you get no integrity. Okay, anybody can make changes, and you won't detect them. Right? So it's a pretty serious, uh, serious problem. So people who should have known much better, if they'd only taken my class. <laughs> uh, okay, so the cryptographic hash functions that are used in practice, by far the two most popular are uh, MD5 and SHA1. The output length for MD, oh, and I should mention MD5, invented by who else? Rivest, right. Okay. Uh, and SHA-1 is a US government standard. It's a little bit longer in terms of the output, right? 128 versus 160. All else being equal, longer is better, right? Because the brute force attack is just that much harder. Uh, but the interesting thing is it's obviously modeled after MD5. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. It's very similar, just do a few extra things in there uh, and increase the, the length. Uh, and those are by far the most popular. Now, uh, MD5 is considered broken okay, because uh, collisions have been found. And in fact, you can download some software that will allow you to construct sort of random collisions in a matter of seconds, you know, a minute maybe on a PC, you know, a minute to construct collisions, all right? So you can get as many collisions for MD5 as you want, okay? Not hard to do. SHA-1, very similar to MD5, okay? So SHA-1 has not been sort of officially broken yet, but they're sort of closing in on it, okay? So it's, it's, it's going, it's going eventually. So <clears throat> what to do? Um, okay, so uh, I don't want to get into the design of hash functions. You know, the, there there is in the book one hash function that go, goes through the, the kind of the inner workings, sort of like what we did with DES and like we did with you know A51 and, and those things. Uh, we just don't have time to cover it. But the important thing, the important point here is that the internal design of hash functions is very similar to block ciphers. Okay, they're really similar concepts. You just take the data in chunks and you process it in chunks and you end up with this small chunk at the end when you're done. Uh, you're not encrypting, of course. You're not, uh, there's no key involved, but it has that sort of flavor of a block cycle. You process the data in chunks, okay. I wish we had time to cover this because it's good, but. Okay, HMAC. Um, okay, now think about this uh, hash function. So we've got this hash. It's useful for digital signatures. Hey, okay, that's great. Uh, you know, but it has a lot of really uh, strong properties. Maybe we can use it for some other things as well. Okay. So here's a thought. Suppose we want an integrity check. Okay. I want to do an integrity check. We've got two different techniques to protect the integrity. What are those two techniques? We could compute a MAC. How do we compute a MAC? 
We do a CBC encryption and save the last block. Okay, so that works. Uh, how else can we compute, uh, protect integrity? Signature, digital signature. Okay, so digital signature or a Mac will work. What about hash function? You know, how about this? Here's what I propose. So I'm going to send my message to you, okay? And to protect the integrity, I'm going to compute a hash of the message, okay, using a strong cryptographic hash. Okay, then I'll send you the message and I'll send you the hash. Okay, when you get the message, you hash the message you receive, you compare it to the hash value you received. If they match, you know nothing has changed, right? Because if you change even one bit, that hash is going to be different. Great, we're done. And we don't even need a key. Whoa, this is like a free lunch. Isn't that great? Is this one of the examples where you can change anything that you send out? Well, if I send it, Trudy can change it, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So she changes both the message and Yeah, okay, so Trudy, right, okay, so that doesn't work. Too bad. Uh, so Trudy could change the message and she could change the hash value, right? So that, you know, it's not going to work. So, but it's close, you know. The hash function has all these nice properties. If you make even a small change to the data, you're going to see a change in the hash value, right? They should be uncorrelated. You shouldn't see any connection there at all. So can we use a hash function to protect the integrity? And the answer is yes, but we need to use a key. Somehow we're going to have to mix a key in there with the hash. All right, there's no free lunch here. We have to have a key or else Trudy can just change them both, right? If there's a key in there, she can't change them without knowing the key. Okay, that's the idea. So we'll call that a hash Mac, okay? Message authentication code with a hash function instead of the CDC encryption. We do need a key. Okay, there's no getting around the need for a key. So the real question here is, how do we compute this? How, in other words, a hash by itself has no key, right? We don't have a key, it just compresses data, right? So how do we put the key in with the hash? How should we do that? What, hash, what do you think? hash the Mac. Hash the Mac. Compute the Mac and then hash that? That's like twice as much work. I don't want to do that. I mean, if I'm computing the Mac, there's no reason to use the hash, right? <laughs> Okay, I'm done if I computed the Mac. How about this? Is there any way I can mix the key in? Okay, there you go. Just to prepend the key to the data or append the key to the data. Those seem like obvious, obvious sorts of things to do. So this just means take your data, right, and put the key in front of it and hash the whole mess. Okay, this just means take your message, put the key at the end, and hash the whole thing. Looks good. Looks simple. Unfortunately, like many things in cryptography, there's some subtle issues with this. And if you do either one of those, there's actually potential problems, OK? Potential for some problems. Um, again, I hate to skip all this good stuff, but we have to skip some stuff. So. Um, I won't go over the details, but just be aware there's potential subtle issues. Kind of depends on the specifics of the hash function and various other things. So it's kind of it's technical. Technical issues arise. So because of that, there's a particular way to compute an HMAC. Okay, you can get around these problems pretty easily, and there's an RFC that spells this out exactly how you're supposed to compute an HMAC. Okay, so here's the rules. Uh, you first construct a block B that's as long as the block used in the hash function. And for all the popular hashes, that's 64 bytes. Okay, so B is 64 bytes. Um, and you make two different blocks of that length. One of them is this byte repeated over 64 times. One of them is this byte repeated over 64 times. Okay, so we've got an iPad and we've got an old pad. Okay, here's the way the HMAC works. Okay, we have a message and a key. Okay. So we compute, first of all, the hash of the key XOR with the iPad prepended to the message. Okay, then we take uh, the key XOR with the OPAD and that result, uh, uh, prepended to that result, and hash that. Okay, that's the approved way to combine a key with a message and a hash. Okay? But wait. This looks like twice as much work. I'm computing a hash here, and then I'm computing a hash here. Why would I ever do twice as much work? I'd be better off just doing the math, right? That's just about as fast as hashing, isn't it? Do you really want to hash everything twice? 
not hashing everything twice. Uh, exactly. Okay, why not? The output of the hash function. Right, okay, so the first thing you do is put the message here, right? And the output of the hash is small. So you only have a small number of bits here that goes with this. So the second hash, the outside hash, is only for a small number of bits. So it's one hash with another really small hash. Okay, you don't get away from hashing all your data. You gotta do it once, but then the second hash is very small. Okay, and the, the idea there is that the key gets thoroughly mixed in. There's no way to sort of pull it apart when you, if you put it at the start or at the end. All right. Uh, okay, I mentioned this for a couple reasons. You know, you should be aware, you know, there's a proper way to compute an HMAC. Uh, but I actually had an experience with this, okay? Uh, at my uh, ill-fated startup company, we were, uh, you know, I was the crypto guy, so we had this problem where we needed an HMAC, okay? So they said, okay, you go write the code for the HMAC. All right, so I looked it up in a book. You know, it's not very complicated, right? So I looked it up in a, in a you know, reputable book, and I wrote the code, got it all set up, all ready to go, and um, just ready to check in the code. I thought, well, you know, there is this RFC thing. Maybe I should check that, just to be safe, you know? So I went and checked the RFC, and the book was wrong. Okay, the book actually had, like, these two things turned around or something like that. It's, you know, subtle, you know, easy typo to make, but that means, you know, if I had put the code in the way I had originally written it, anybody else who did the HMAC properly couldn't communicate with our code. And it would have been a pain to find that bug, right? <laughs> to figure out where that was. So the point is, you know, read the RFCs. They're, they're, they're there for a reason. 